Hello and welcome everybody and today I'm very pleased to introduce Dr Bobby Sherrill who has written a book and um, I'll hold the book up and I hope that possibly you can see it maybe in focus may not I can't quite ever work it out all about our immune system and it's funny isn't it I know we all, we all know what well, we think we know what the immune system is but I think it's something that we take for granted um, and you know it's only when it goes wrong do we suddenly realize that perhaps we should be paying a bit more attention to our, our general health really um and bobby as he likes to be referred to has spent his life or his career rather in looking into this really important system he's an immunologist and an educator in the system he's based at massachusetts general hospital but also within the faculties of harvard and mit so he's definitely the person to tell us all about this subject. So welcome, Bobby. Thank you very much, Katriona. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak with your listeners. So first of all, I think probably it'd be a good start um, to sort of say, well, let, you know, what is the defini definition of an in immune system? What is it? What does it do for us? So the immune system is the collection of cells and molecules that all of us have in various parts of our body at, that work together to provide resistance to infection. They basically, these cells and molecules basically provide us a system of defense against the microorganisms that are always around us and that are trying to get a foothold in our tissues and potentially cause disease. And is it something, isn't it, that our body it's invisible in the sense that our body is continually fighting off all of these things to attack us, I suppose. That is absolutely correct. Um, the immune system is constantly at work. Uh, the cells are deployed at strategic points around the body, in our skin, in the lining of our gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory system and other surfaces, the points of entry where microorganisms may try to get a foothold in our tissues. And so the cells of the immune system are constantly monitoring these sites for potential intruders. And if such an intrusion occurs, the cells are there ready to mount a defense that prevents the organisms, the microorganisms, from, from multiplying within our tissues and potentially causing damage and clinically observable disease. Yes, so the immune system is constantly at work. And we, I guess we appreciate this, as you said, only when there is a problem with our immune system that prevents this constant defensive function from operating normally. And if that happens, then of course we become susceptible to various diseases, including infectious diseases. So is our immune system, so I mean, from birth, we're all born with an immune system. Is it something that we inherit or part of it's inherited from our, our parents or, or how does it develop? So, yes, of course we do. Um, there is an inherited component to the immune system in that there are genes that control the development of the cells and molecules of the immune system and that control their normal function. And those genes, of course, are inherited from our parents. So in that sense, yes, we do inherit the uh, ability to defend ourselves from infection uh, from our parents. But that said, once we the immune system has developed, and that occurs very early during um, the development of the embryo and fetus, uh, once, we, once the immune system has developed, it is of course under the influence of various environmental factors. And those environmental factors can also influence the way the immune system develops and functions. So the ultimate properties of the immune system that we uh, have as adults uh, is dependent on both the inherited characteristics that we receive from our parents but also the environmental influences that we are subject to um, as we grow up and, and develop. Mm -hmm. So there are both genetic factors as well as environmental factors that play a role in determining uh, the properties of our immune system. 
Well, I mean, when I was younger, you know, my mother was all, it was all very much about, it's, you know, a bit of dirt is very good for you because it's going to make you stronger. And uh, then we've heard over over time that, you know, it's all getting far too clean and sterile, which means that we're, our immune systems are compromised. Is, is that true? Uh, in a sense, it is. So in fact, um, your mother was correct that um, a little bit of exposure to microorganisms. So we are, the, the environment that we live in is full of microorganisms. And these microorganisms, especially those that reside in close proximity to our tissues, play an important role in educating, if you will, the immune system and training it to have certain uh, properties that allow it to resist invasion by more harmful pathogenic microorganisms. So yes, the in microorganisms in our environment, particularly the community that lives in our tissues, known as the microbiota, plays an important role in um, educating and training the immune system uh, in a way that is most beneficial for protection against more pathogenic harmful uh, organisms. So um, having an ultra clean environment uh, is not good for the immune system. So as an illustration, mice that are raised under completely germ-free conditions, they are born and raised in a completely sterile environment, do not have normal immune functions. Their immune systems do not develop normally and they are compromised in certain functions that are required to resist the invasion by pathogenic organisms. So it is, it is important that we are exposed to uh, a certain extent to the normal microbial community that is always around us, because that community does play an important role in educating and training our immune system so that it has the appropriate functional capabilities to resist more dangerous microorganisms. And I suppose you see that as well, isn't it? it because, well, I, I presume this, all the research is, you know, in different parts of the world, they can have completely different immunity systems. For example, drink, you know, I, one would always think of drinking the water. So, you know, if we drunk dirty water in a very Western civilization, it would not be great. Whereas in other areas where the, you know, the, the, the um, I can't think what the word is, the cleanliness of the water is not quite, that would be a very different immune system, wouldn't it? Yes, well, you're right, yes. Um, so I wouldn't say completely different. So the basic properties of the immune system are very similar between human populations in different parts of the world. But you're correct that the in differences in the environment, say mm -hmm. between the UK and Sub-Saharan Africa, does do mean that the immune systems of people living in those two regions of the world may be a little different in terms of their ability to deal with um, pathogens or other challenges. So, and this is where I, uh, you know, I mentioned that the properties of the immune system are determined both by genetic influences and by environmental influences. So the genetic influences lead to overall similar properties of the immune system. So if you were to characterize the immune system of someone in the UK versus someone in Africa, the basic characteristics would be very similar. But yeah. because of the differences in the environment between the UK and, and Africa, there could also be more subtle differences between the immune systems of people in those two parts of the world. And that's where the environmental influences come in because the environment, including the microbes that an individual is exposed to in the environment do play an important role in conditioning the immune system. So that if you are exposed to a different microbial environment, your immune system may behave a little differently from someone in a completely different microbial environment. So what's the, you know, is it good or what's the best thing to build up your immune system i mean is it good to be as a mother to be aware of it to build it up for your child as soon as possible or are there things that we can do throughout our life so for most of us we really don't need to worry about our immune system so the immune system is evolutionarily programmed to function optimally for most of us okay so you don't really need to worry 
about strengthening your immune system. Um, it's capable of looking after itself very well without uh, much intervention from our side. But that said, there are things that can be potentially um, harmful in the sense that it may skew the immune response in a way that may not be the best for our health. So if our diet is very rich in fats or very rich in ultra processed foods, that changes the microbiota, uh, the microbial community that lives normally in our gastrointestinal tract and other tissues, and that can influence the behavior of the immune system. So a diet that is very fat rich, very rich in ultra processed foods, or on the other hand, lacking in important micronutrients such as iron can make the immune system malfunction to a certain extent. Now I have to emphasize that the, the, these, these uh, uh, unwanted effects are really seen only at extremes. So for most of us, as I said, you know, if we have a reasonable diet, uh, if we exercise moderately, uh, if we don't um, uh, smoke excessively or drink excessively, our immune system is absolutely fine and able to take care of itself. We don't really have to think about it. Uh, it's only when individuals um, uh, suffer extremes of diet or other practices that there may be a potential harmful effect on the immune system. So you hear a lot, and we speak quite a lot about auto, you know your autoimmune diseases, and are they things that can be triggered off? by something so you know your body gets the trigger and then it sets itself up right down the wrong path basically yes uh, in a sense yes so um, many autoimmune diseases uh, so the autoimmune diseases are uh, conditions in which the immune system is inappropriately activated and instead of responding only to um, microbial threats they also start to respond to substances that are normally harmless for most people, either no normal substances in our environment or even components of our own tissues. And so this inappropriate activation of the immune system can be damaging to our tissues and that damage can manifest as various types of diseases. Now, the way in which uh, autoimmune diseases develop, it can be linked to abnormalities of the immune system, which are themselves determined both by genetic factors and by environmental factors. So many studies over the last 10 or 20 years have shown that people who develop autoimmune diseases have certain genetic predisposition caused by variations in the genes that they inherit from their parents. But that is not the whole story. That accounts only for part of the risk of developing an um, autoimmune disease. There are also environmental influences that could be related, again, as I mentioned, to the kind of environment that you that an individual is exposed to, including the environment, the microbes in one's environment, because those in microbes play an important role in conditioning the immune system. Um, and then, of course, as you mentioned, there can be environmental triggers that can set off an autoimmune or autoinflammatory process. So individuals who are allergic to components of uh, food or other things in their, um, their environment will develop the disease only if they are exposed to that particular trigger. So there are both, again, genetic influences that determine whether an individual will develop an autoimmune disease or not. But there are also environmental factors, including importantly, the microbial environment uh, in which an individual um, is living or uh, has, has grown up in. Hmm. And of course, oh, sorry. So I was going to say that in terms of um, uh, managing autoimmune diseases, there is not too much that we can do about the genetic component. Uh, it's very difficult to alter 
to alter one's genes, but we can modify the environment in a way that reduces the risk of, um, of developing such diseases. Um, and so, um, again, uh, having the, uh, a, a normal diet, a, a healthy diet, um, moderate amounts of exercise, avoiding things like smoking and excessive alcohol intake, all these can influence uh, the way in which the immune system is conditioned, both directly or by influencing the composition of our microbiota. And so that can alter the way the immune system functions and may help to counteract some of the genetic influence that would otherwise lead to the development of an autoimmune disease. And which, you know, what autoimmune diseases do you see or what are most prevalent? What are most prevalent? Yeah. So the, the prevalence of autoimmune diseases and allergies in general has been rising over the last 40 or 50 years. And this is clearly not related to changes in genetics. It is linked to changes in environment. And the changes in environment include alterations in the kind of microbes that we are exposed to in the environment and that play a role in conditioning our immune systems. So uh, the prevalence of diseases such as food allergies, um, uh, lupus, uh, asthma, uh, atopic dermatitis or eczema, uh, all those uh, conditions have been increasing in their occurrence over the last 40 or 50 years. And the general idea in the field is that this is related to changes in our environment. And I don't want to say that it is ex exclusively related to an, the increased cleanliness of the environment. Uh, but it is due to a change in microbial exposures. It's very, I mean, I, I want to emphasize for your listeners that um, living in a clean environment is not bad. I mean, there are many, many infectious diseases that are spread through contaminated food and water. And we certainly don't want to have uh, such diseases occurring as a result of um, um, uh, deterioration of the hygienic conditions in which we live. So having a clean environment is very important. But uh, it is also important to say that um, uh, the microbes that we are exposed to do play an important role in conditioning our immune system. And um, the general idea is that changes in our lifestyle that alter the kind of microbes that live within us, um, that change probably does influence the increasing incidence of uh, autoimmune diseases that we are experiencing currently. Mm. And also with some things that you have exposure to that, and then our immune system fights against it, that then gives us more immunity to further attack, presumably. That is correct, yes. An important property of the immune system is what is termed as memory. And that is that once the immune system has been exposed to a specific microorganism, let's call it microbe A, there is a change in the immune system that makes it better able to respond to that particular microbe, microbe A, if it is ever encountered again. So the second time the immune system is exposed to microbe A, it will be able to respond much more quickly and much more effectively. And so we'll be able to eliminate that particular microorganism more efficiently than um, if the if the organism were being seen for the first time. Hmm. So that so, property of memory is uh, what uh, allows us to resist infection better following vaccination, for instance. That was the word that I wanted to talk about because you cover it in your book. I'm always fascinated when we hear about vaccination because I'm very pro-vaccination for lots of things and I think if there's an opportunity to promote it I'm very keen to do so so yeah. you know and I think you've just given a really good example of why we should have vaccination so that you know the sooner we were vaccinated as babies in particular we are you know well that just goes to show the immune system we don't know it's working it's magics to protect us as we get older yeah yeah so that's right so let's let's take a, a concrete example 
So suppose you have an infant or a child who has never been vaccinated against measles, for instance. If that child is exposed to measles, the measles virus, it takes some time for the immune system to mount an effective response. So the various cells, specific cells of the immune system have to be triggered by the measles virus. Those cells have to multiply, increase in number sufficiently that they can then mount the appropriate defense to eliminate the measles virus before it can cause disease. And that takes time. It takes about two to three weeks before the response becomes effective enough to be able to eliminate the virus. Now, during that time, of course, the measles virus is multiplying madly and replicating. And so if the viral replication is more rapid than the ability of the immune system con to contain the virus, then the virus will cause disease. And that's what happens in individuals who are not vaccinated against the measles virus. Usually the virus will gain the upper hand and will cause disease before the immune system is able to control the virus. That's in the unvaccinated child. Now, if you take the vaccinated child who has been given the measles vaccination, and the measles vaccine is basically a weakened form of the measles virus that is not able to cause disease on its own in normal individuals. But when the immune system is exposed to the vaccine strain of the measles virus, the, immune, the cells of the immune system now are triggered to become activated, to multiply, and then to generate a specific class of cell known as memory lymphocytes. And there are two types of memory lymphocytes, memory B cells and memory T cells. We won't get into the, the, the technical details, but these memory cells, along with the antibodies that have been produced in response to the vaccine, are hanging around in, our, in the child's tissues and constantly patrolling the tissues. And the antibodies are constantly in circulation. Now, if that vaccinated child is infected by the actual virulent measles virus, these preformed components or pre-activated components of the immune system, the memory lymphocytes and the circulating antibodies that have been produced in response to the vaccination are already there. They're just raring to go. They're already you know, present and able to mount a very rapid and effective response against the measles virus. And so in this vaccinated individual, it is the immune system that will win the fight between the virus and the host. And so the vaccinated child's immune system will be able to contain the growth of the virus before it can actually cause disease. Okay, so the vaccination has basically generated a population of memory lymphocytes and preformed antibodies that are ready and available to fight against the, uh, the virulent measles virus if it is ever encountered. No, and that all makes sense because I can sort of see it all whizzing around the body, just waiting because it's it's there waiting. So, but we may move on to, you know, the dreaded word COVID. Now, so COVID, you know, I don't know what's happening in the States, but in the UK, we're having less and less vaccinations and i think also people are saying well we don't need it so much although we have covid still carrying on you know definitely you know it's definitely around um but i as i understand it covid has changed its its format so to speak yes but with so for example but with measles does measles change its format in the same way as covid or is it completely different so the measles virus all viruses are able to mutate and change the their characteristics, yeah. yes, in order to try to escape the immune system. Now, the COVID virus is particularly effective in this kind of mutational change, and which is why it is constantly trying to evade and elude immune defenses. Measles, fortunately, is not so effective at mutating and escaping our defenses. Now, um, that does not mean that vaccination against COVID is not effective. 
um, it is effective uh, because the vaccine induced response does confer a degree uh, of good protection against even a highly mutating virus and will help to slow the growth of the virus enough that the worst forms of the disease that the virus is capable of causing do not occur. And fortunately, we have learned how to change the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, so that the immune system is able to recognize even mutated forms of the COVID virus. Now, there is, again, you have to think of this as a constant battle between the virus and the immune system. And so the COVID virus, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, is, uh, is very clever in terms of being able to mutate and um, evade immune defenses. But our vaccines are also keeping up with these mutated forms of the virus. So if you receive boosters of the appropriate vaccine against the circulating strains of the virus that are prevalent in our environment, um, we have a good chance of containing the, rep the growth of the virus so that it is unable to cause serious disease. It may not, the vaccine may not prevent infection completely. It may not prevent mild disease, but it will certainly help to prevent severe disease. And I think that's, um, I don't know, whenever I speak to people about it, it's, you know, I always feel saying it doesn't stop you getting the disease, whether it's COVID or measles or whatever it is. But exactly as you said, it means that you're not going to get it as badly. And That's then right. obviously then then the consequence is when you start looking of them passing it on to somebody else and then all of those things of how things gather steam really, isn't it? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, when you get vaccinated, you are not protecting only yourself, but you are also protecting other members in your community because mm -hmm. if enough people in a community get vaccinated and are protected uh, against serious disease, uh, sometimes against even infection itself, then the chances of the virus spreading within the community are reduced. And so even people within that community who are not vaccinated, either because they have not received the vaccine or because they are unable to receive the vaccine for one reason or another, are protected because the transmission of the virus is reduced within the community. Mm -hmm. So vaccination is good, is good both for yourself as an individual, but also good for other people in your community. Absolutely. So just sort of one last thing that um, I think everyone's sort of fascinated is about the future. What are, what are, what are people working on now in regards to the immune system to help protect us for things that we don't know around the corner. And of course, COVID has made us all aware that there, there, there are other things that are going to be around the corner. Yes, so that's what, right. what, what's, it, what's the future looking like? So I think the current, one of the current emphases in, in, in the field is how to harness the immune system in order to achieve therapeutic benefits, either in terms of preventing the occurrence of disease or um, treating disease once it has occurred. So research over the last 100 years or so has given us great insight into how the immune system works in very, very great detail. Now there is a lot of interest in trying to use that knowledge that we've gained in order to manipulate immune function in a way that helps us to either prevent or treat disease. In terms of prevention, Vaccination is a huge success story, um, and that has um, sort of propelled the field of immunology uh, forward in terms of both understanding mechanisms and making use of that understanding to prevent disease. Uh, in terms of therapeutics, we are now at a point where we can actually manipulate the functions of the various cells and molecules of the immune system in a way that will help us to treat disease. One of the most um, dramatic achievements that has occurred over the last five or 10 years is in the treatment of cancers by manipulating the immune system, by various interventions 
that help the immune system to better kill the cancer cells that could then that could otherwise lead to the development of disease. So there are two very, very interesting ways in which the immune system is being manipulated for the treatment of cancer. One is by the use of reagents that interfere with molecules that prevent the immune system from fully doing its function. Those molecules are there for a reason and are helpful, uh, but in the context of cancer, they can prevent the immune system from fully executing its ability to kill cancerous cells. And so various investigators and companies have developed reagents that inhibit the function of these so-called breaks on the immune system, allowing the immune system then to fully engage with the cancer and eliminate it. So that's one uh, very important therapeutic manipulation of the immune system. Even more recently, uh, people have developed ways to specifically alter uh, one type of immune cell known as the T lymphocyte so that they are armed or weaponized specifically against the cancer so that those weaponized T cells can act attack the cancerous cells more vigorously and eliminate them. And this particular strategy has resulted in the very, very dramatic results in certain types of cancer. For instance, in the case of uh, a skin cancer known as melanoma. Mm -hmm. So in some forms of melanoma, it was almost a death sentence because it was very resistant to treatment. But the use of these weaponized T cells has resulted in miraculous, um, unbelievable elimination of the melanoma and the survival of these patients for several years beyond their normal normal expectations. Yeah, so I mean, I can see why this field of medicine can be so appealing because you can you're looking at so many different you can look at so many different areas. Yes, through the immune system is how you can support um, everything. Yes. So um, the immune system is involved directly or indirectly in a large number of these disease, diseases. I think one of my colleagues estimated that about 70% of human diseases can be attributed to abnormalities of the immune system in one way or another. So um, diseases that you would not normally think of as being connected to immune function. So for instance, obesity, hypertension, coronary artery disease, uh, these are not diseases that we would have thought had any connection to the immune system. For instance, when I was in medical school, that was not a link that had been made. But now we have a pretty good understanding of how abnormalities of the immune system can contribute to the development of these diseases. And so, uh, yes, it is important. The immune system plays a role in you know, normal defense against infection, but also plays a role in many human diseases. And so being able to First of all, understand how the immune system works and then using that understanding to control the way in which the immune system functions has implications for a large number of diseases beyond what we would have normally associated yeah. with immune Absolutely. function. But yeah. it's funny, and I think I probably say this every recording, is that we go back to the basics, though. If we look after, you know, we don't smoke, we maybe drink in moderation and we look at our diet, a lot of these things will not necessarily be eliminated but the impact on our lives can be significant. Yes, and absolutely. Not, and not triggered them off to start with. That's right. Absolutely. I agree with you completely. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. I've realised we've been chatting away for a good half an hour and I, I it just whizzed by because it's absolutely fascinating. And, uh, and I know that this is probably, our conversation was probably quite basic for you because I, having looked at your book and it, I mean, your book is very, as I said earlier, is very eloquent and articulate on what I think is probably can be a very complex um, area. But thank you very much for explaining it so well. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>